in spite of the self-confident appearance of the whole country, sometimes perhaps even the arrogant image of the country. It is full of secret dread and apprehension. It was created by persecuted people. And at least in every single night, people are still persecuted here. People still experience the nightmares of the past. It's, it's a horrible feeling. I mean, looking at all the destruction and all the people who got killed here. I mean, how can every human being react to such a thing? I mean, the real reaction of the world should be now a real disgust. Look what has been in Malot, in Kiryat Shmona. Everybody's forgetting. They have a very short memory. We are very peculiar people. The more we are squeezed, the more we are pushed, the morale is coming up. And uh, our best days were when we were we were pressured most. After four wars and countless emergencies, Israelis are no strangers to pressure. But the pressures on Israel in the wake of the October 1973 war are something different. For the first time, Israel did not come out of a war a clear winner. The Israeli economy was sent reeling by the costs of the Yom Kippur War. Israel saw nation after nation back away from her in a frantic effort to keep their oil flowing. And the Palestine Liberation Organization, Israel's sworn enemy, was embraced by much of the international community. Clearly, things have changed in Israel since the 1973 war. The mood is different, and yet life does go on, as though everyone were still determined that someday life would become so normal that it would be possible to say Middle East without automatically adding the word crisis. suggesting that, uh, at least for the older generation, after 30 years of sympathy by the world, the situation regarding the Jewish people has more or less reverted to what it was before, the, before World War II. Oh yes, and some of the veterans, the more sophisticated ones among the, the old-timers, well, they do realize the ironic implication about Zionism, because one of the purposes of Zionism was to normalize Jewish life. Let's become a nation, a normal nation like every other. Let the world forget about us altogether. And now here we are stuck once again in a very typically Jewish situation. For many Israelis, everyday life is a matter of expecting the worst and preparing for it. Early morning along the Israeli-Lebanon frontier, and a steel-plated unit of the Israeli Border Patrol works its way along the dividing line looking for armed intruders. This kind of security is simply a normal way of life on the border, and especially to a border kibbutz like Misgav Am, lying cheek to jowl with neighboring Lebanon. When we look down there, we see, as you say, a couple of Lebanese villages. Do they live fairly normal lives, as far as you can tell? Uh, not really normal lives, because we know just now there's a group, a big group of terrorists, in the village inside. Down in that village? Yeah, down in that village. And I think that uh, even the Arab and the Lebanon the people inside, they haven't their normal life as they have it before. But we can't uh, help them, we can't solve the problem. Do you ever look forward to a time, ever, when the Lebanese can come over here freely and you can go down there? Uh, we didn't uh, come to the village for a long, long time. But they come till the, the six-day war, till the border, till the fence here, and they cultivate their lands here. And uh, hard times they come and we help them with bread and uh, other foods, and we give them. You mean but before 1967 you yeah, worked with the yeah, Lebanese farmers We help yeah. them, yeah, we help them. But a little bit. And uh, the Lebanon army, the Lebanon police, stopped it. They stopped it? From their reasons. We don't know why, but they stop it. Despite the security problem, Misgav Am thrives. And so does this settlement, halfway across the country. 
Nevatim is in the Negev Desert, created out of the desert by a small Jewish community that came to Israel from India 20 years ago. That the village succeeded and prospered is still regarded as a small miracle, and not the least by the man who helped found it. I think that uh, Yitzhak is important he, for, for Israel. He's a young farmer. He came here with his parents uh, about uh, 20 years ago. I was the instructor in this village, which was completely isolated in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert. Was there uh, actually a village here? No, no, no. There was nothing at all. The, just, just desert. Let me, uh, let, me, let me understand this now. This was just, this was just desert. This was no just houses, desert. No, no houses, houses, no, no vegetation. No vegetation, no nothing. And this small group of, of Jews from Cochin, yes. India, came here and settled on this place to build it. Yes. What took some imagination was to see that growing roses and tulips in the desert would not only be possible, but actually profitable. And to envision that there could be a market for the flowers in, of all places, a flower-growing country like Holland. But such is the case. And the desert actually turns out to be the ideal place for these second-generation farmers from India to have wrought their small miracle. Well, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, Itzhak is, is uh, as I said, a farmer, and uh, his parents brought him here when he was 13. <laughs> now, here is his brother, Ephraim, who was uh, eight years old when he came here, and he's a farmer, too, here. And the third brother, Meir, uh, Ben Kamata, and he's 25, and he stays here farming, too. And two cousins, one also Meir, and he's in the army, and he's just on, on leave now, and he's working on the tractor here, and uh, Danny, who is a cousin. So uh, I they all, all five of them came here in that all, group. All five of them came when, when they were little children. He was the oldest, and they were all uh, small children when they and came. And they all have their families here and now? And they all have their families here. And n have any of the, uh, the original children from the group, have they left? Uh, may, may I no, he says there's no place. And why have they stayed here rather than going on to Tel Aviv? He says he thinks it's a very good place and they can make a very good living here. And he says if they won't be here, who will be here? <laughs> he says uh, the Gurion told them you stay here. And so they stay here. It's a long way from the hothouses of Nevatim to the hangars of Israel aircraft industries. But one fact links them. In a difficult economy, they both succeed with products aimed at ready markets. Israel aircraft industries, which recently produced Israel's first homemade jet fighter, also makes the Gabriel ship-to-ship -ship guided missile system, the only one that's operational in the world. It also makes a business jet that competes successfully in that field in many countries, including the United States. And it turns out a short takeoff and landing plane that's in such demand, the company won't say exactly which countries are buying. But today's Israel is in a wartime economy, and the economic situation of the average Israeli is grim indeed. Per capita taxes are the highest in the world, import duties are staggering, a two-job family is almost a norm, and social services have been cut to meet the needs of defense. What peace would bring Israel is a few more achievements like the city of Arad. Starting with nothing but sand and brush, Israeli planners constructed a city, quite literally, out of the desert. High above the Dead Sea, it was created to provide a home for workers in the potash works below. And it has become the touchstone of a great controversy in Israeli political life today. Whether to let Israelis settle in territories held by the Arabs before 1967 or confine new settlements to the original borders. After the Six Day War, I started saying that uh, it is the land of our fathers, like this land, like the land of the 12 tribes east of the Jordan, but it's also the land of another people, the West Bank. And it's densely populated by Palestinian Arabs. And we need security, we don't need encroachment on, 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 on their land in the West Bank. But for a price, and the only price is peace. The Sinai Desert. Israel is not likely to be surprised again, as she was in 1973. And towards this end, 
the tough Israeli officer corps puts the Sinai army through its paces again and again. Wars are short in the Sinai. Waiting for war is long and tedious. The peninsula is barren, almost empty of habitation. One travels mile after mile to see nothing but sand. It isn't an easy duty for the Israeli soldier, who, when he is assigned here, will probably spend his entire three-year hitch in an isolated desert camp, waiting. If you had to fight up here, it would be your first time. Hmm. How do you feel about that? Nobody likes it, that's for sure. If I have to, then I will, but uh, I hope there will never come any fighting. You're afraid you might get hurt? <laughs> Obviously. There's always a fear of that if you're a soldier in the front lines. There's always a fear of that. Is it something that's on your mind a lot? No. You just kick it out. You can't live with that all the time. How about the other men? Do they think about it, do you think? No, we, we simply do not talk about it. We avoid the subject. Or if we, if we do talk about it, it's only in a sort of black humor way, you know, to kick it out of our minds. We don't think about it realistic, because otherwise it would be too depressing. How old are you? I'm 21. 21? How old are the other men? They're 18, 19. 18, 19, Yeah, 21. you mean my crew? Yeah. Yeah. 18, 19. It is said that the Yom Kippur War was a shock to the nervous system of Israel. Did that shock affect the young people of Israel the same as it did the older generation, or was, is there a difference? Well, it did affect both, but in very different ways. To many of the veterans here in Kibbutz Hunda, uh, it is just and only back to normal, back to normalcy of, of Jewish abnormalcy, back to Jewish history of alienation, misunderstanding, hostility. How is it possible, we ask? We look at men come of age in the 20th century, deciding who's going to live and who's going to die. To the left, with the wave of a hand, life. To the right, with the wave of a hand, death. Auschwitz and the infamous decision that sent the strongest to the work camps and the rest to the gas chambers. Three decades later, in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, the Holocaust seems very relevant to many Israelis. Not all the outrages are as gross as mass murder. Not all took place in Hitler's Europe. But they are outrages all the same, and they are remembered. We are now standing in the Jewish cemetery of Mount of Olives, where Jews have been buried since 2,000 years, since the first century BC. In 1948, after the War of Independence, the mountain became to be, became to be in the possession of the Jordanian Arabs. As such, immediately after the war, since 1949, they began systematically and daily to demolish the cemetery. We are now in the Jordanian military camp of the 6th Infantry Jordanian Battalion, which was here a training camp and a recruiting camp before the Six Days War. All the camp is built out of stones, most of them tombstones, which were taken after they were taken from the Jewish cemetery on Mount of Olives and brought here to the camp. The road on which I'm walking now was built so that the Jordanian officers won't mud their shoes. This road, to protect the mud, is built out of tombstones. Here again, I am entering a tough office the entrance to which is built of tombstones. The route I'm walking now on is the way, again built out of tombstones, which leads to the toilet. The toilet, which also was built out of destroyed tombstones, and here by the toilet you still can read the letters which say, Ponikbar Harav David, and the date of his burial.
In the 19 years that Jordan controlled half of Jerusalem, 40,000 tombstones were torn up. In the old city, the Jewish quarter was laid waste and dozens of synagogues were destroyed. The Western Wall, the holiest Jewish site in Jerusalem, was closed off to Israelis. In the June 1967 war, Israel took control of the entire city. Now Israeli political and religious spokesmen insist that the city will not be divided again, regardless of any pressure applied from outside. Although Israel controls the entire west bank of the Jordan, the bridges across the river have not been closed. This means that Arab trucks with goods from Gaza and the West Bank can cross into Jordan, sell their produce, and come back to do the same thing the next day. But to satisfy Jordanian officials, the Israeli license plates are taken off in favor of Jordanian plates until the trucks come back when the process is reversed. Has the bridge ever been closed since it was first opened after the Six-Day War in 1967? No. Uh Except for uh, Saturdays and uh, holidays, uh, the bridge was operating, the two bridges, Alembi and Damia, were operating, uh -huh, operating until this very day. In a time of the unexpected terrorist attack, Israeli security is vigorous, and the Arab travelers are resigned to it. Despite more than 800,000 crossings on the bridge last year, very few terrorists or weapons successfully evade detection at this customs checkpoint. For most Arabs, the inconvenience is worth the right to visit relatives in Jordan or do business on the other side of the river. In fact, the economy of the West Bank is thriving to the point where several Arab spokesmen have advocated closing the bridges on the theory that this would pinch the West Bankers economically and bring on some restiveness. The Gaza Strip, like the West Bank, was conquered by Israel during the Six-Day War of June 1967. Unlike the West Bank, it was not expected to yield to a benign Israeli occupation. For one thing, half of the population consisted of refugees living in refugee camps, a certain source of discontent. For another, the Gaza Strip was a hotbed of terrorist activity. But today, Gaza is thriving and peaceful. There is no unemployment in the Strip, compared to a 43% jobless rate before 1967. Refugees and non-refugees are treated alike and can travel freely in Israel. Local affairs are run by Arabs. Conditions in the refugee camps of Gaza will still look appalling to Western observers, but the average Gazian has more money in his pocket than ever before. Thousands of them now work in Israel, earning Israeli salaries and they can set their sights a little higher. When Israel put up new housing at reasonable prices, the homes were snapped up. By Gaza standards, they are a jump into the 20th century and a political bonus for the Israeli administration in the Strip. Has the life of the, life of the children here changed much since the Yom Kippur War? Yeah, it changed because, uh, first of all, we have more to guard ourselves and they can't walk outside of the kibbutz without guarding. And now to play, they can't play outside from the kibbutz, only in the kibbutz area. The watchword in Israel today is security, which means armed men on guard. Throughout the country, the man with a rifle is commonplace. In a kibbutz on the Lebanese border, in the marketplace of a main city, in a town in the Jordan Valley, in a high school south of Tel Aviv, in a seaside resort on the Mediterranean. And the reason, of course, terrorist attacks like those which killed eight civilians in the heart of Tel Aviv and 26, mostly school children, in Mahalot and 18 in an apartment building in Kiryat Shimona after an attack on a school failed. Esther and Pnina, they lived in the same building, what happened the case. Did it make them afraid about living in that apartment house? They say that uh, to live in the Kiryat Shmuna, to live in Kiryat Shmuna, they don't spread, but uh, to live in the same building, they scared. Do they live in that building now? 
האם אתם גרים עכשיו באותה דירה? לא. לא. זה מעודד. זה מעודד. זה מעודד. זה מעודד. זה מעודד. זה מעודד. This bunker that you see here used to be, before 67, the most forward Israeli position. On the other side, you can see the Golan Heights, what used to be, before 67, Syrian territory. We are now on the Golan Heights. From this place, you can see the Israeli settlements down in the valley, Gadot, Ayelet HaShachar, over there, up to Kiryat Shmona. As you see, they had no difficulties reaching the Israeli settlements with their guns and even with uh, machine guns. And sometimes at the people who used to work there even with submachine guns. The Golan Heights is where the most vicious fighting took place between Arabs and Israelis, both in 1967 and 1973. It's an area of special tension. After the 1973 war, a no-man's land was created under United Nations supervision. But it's a paper buffer. If war breaks out, the fighting on the Golan Heights will be fierce, costly, and not necessarily decisive. To me, this painful experience of fighting on the Golan Heights in a tank unit was a very vital lesson in the uh, superiority of an army of intelligent civilians, really. An army of thousands of generals and very few sergeants and privates. An army where reserve units may consist of two university lecturers, one tradesman, two salesmen, three peasants, and professor of history. The problem in the Yom Kippur War was that uh, we were a little surprised. We won't be again, and it'll be much easier for us, impossible for them. But let me ask you in general, you may be better prepared, but how do you feel about the possibility of another war up here? I mean, people are going to die. How do you feel about that? You said about people dying. You can't prevent this. You see, it's reality. So we have to face it. Every individual is cared for himself, for friends, for relatives. No one wants a war. I don't want a war. I don't think a, any officer or soldier in the Syrian army wants a war. No one wants a war, but, well, the question is, uh, will we have to fight one or not? What, what price do you personally feel that Israel should pay to avoid war? I don't think Israel should pay anything to the Arabs to avoid war. And give is to give in territories, okay, give in the Golan Heights, and then you have the Jordan Valley in the same danger it was Ten years ago, we need something firm from the Arabs. They can't just say peace. I mean, peace is, is a very beautiful word, but we have to see something, and we haven't see, seen anything in the last 28 years. <laughs> And sung by children in a kibbutz in northern Israel, it has a special irony. It means, we brought you peace. Perched high on a mountain overlooking the Dead Sea, it's possible to forget that Israel is an embattled nation today. For this little while, anyway, the possibility of war and the pressures of petrodollars seem remote. In fact, all the pressures would be even more intolerable if it weren't true that with it all, life goes on. On this mountain wilderness, youngsters have come together from all over Israel to build a primitive trail so that others can explore the mountain. It has no strategic significance, no military value. It's just something that boys and girls might do, perhaps in any normal nation. And although every school in Israel is protected by armed guards, life in the school goes on as usual. It's not an easy feat in a country where pre-military training starts at 16, and where boys and girls go into the army at 18. 
There isn't much in the curriculum of the school to remind anyone that there may be another war, although all the children are aware of it. Life goes on. It's very, very far from the uh, marvelous, idyllic dreams of the funders, the dreams with which I was reared. On the other hand, hand, it's equally far from the nightmares, from the dreads, from the secret apprehension which we all experience at this phase or another. It is alive. It is alive. And it's going to be alive. <laughs>